We want God to answer us a certain way. Then we want to come to church and we want somebody to give us confirmation. And then when we want conf- confirmation, then we want to put a fleece out that, God, if it was really you, I want you to do this and I want you to do that. And then we never move. Many of us are sacrificing the blessings, the bountiful blessings, the exceeding abundantly blessings that God wants to do in our lives because we won't get up and move. I am uh, uh, amazed at the sense of entitlement that I run into on a regular basis. I am, I am amazed at how people think that they deserve things that they have not worked for. I just, I, ooh, oh, y'all met them too? Y'all, y'all, ooh, I, it's not just me. I'm amazed. I am amazed how when people have not done anything, have not contributed anything, have not helped in any way, think that they deserve the benefit of something that you worked hard for. Lord, help me today. And unfortunately, it's not just the children. When I was growing up, they taught us how to say, tell them, thank you. What you going to say? They gave you something. What you going to say? Matter of fact, they would say, they, they would teach, uh, they would teach the babies how to say thank you before the babies could talk. The baby would be running around, you give them something, they say, ta-ta. Now, the babies will cuss you out. And it's not their fault because they're getting cussed out all the time. They think it's normal. And now we live in a day, we live in a time where people are ungrateful, unthankful, and entitled. Think they got something coming at your expense. I just, I, uh, um, I would say to you, Chick-fil-A get more money than they should just because they say thank you and have a nice day. It's some places that I went in to spend my money and they looked like they had an attitude that I was there. I said, don't worry about it. You won't get my money. (laughs) Won't be back no more. (laughs) And so we see this miracle that Jesus is teaching, this miracle uh, uh, that Jesus, the scripture has captured, and and these uh, lepers, y'all. Now, see, so we don't, we don't. I, and I recently saw in the news where there are some leprosy uh, cases arising in Florida. So, it, it, so it, it might be back. But I'm so thankful the book told me that he can heal leprosy. So I ain't got to be scared of leprosy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 this in this time. In this day, if you had leprosy, you were not allowed to live in the general society. If you had leprosy, you then were evicted from your life. Whatever your life is, whatever your life was, your family structure, you can no longer live with your family. Your job, your occupation, you couldn't. In this time in the Bible, if you had leprosy, you had to go outside the city and live in a colony of people that had the same issue that you had. Because if you had leprosy, it was contagious. And it was something that would cause people to say, I don't want your issue to bleed on me and become my issue. So you have to go outside because we don't have that issue. I want to park right there because it's a lot of us who judge folks because they got an issue we don't have. And we forget that we have an issue too. And the same blood of Jesus that covers them, the same name that saves them, it saves us too. But we want to pick and choose. Okay, okay, okay. All right. So in this, with this illness of leprosy, leprosy was a a illness, a condition, a situation where your body parts would slowly die. And began to fall off of you. 
So, so leprosy, having leprosy and then being assigned to a, a colony or being assigned to live with only leprosy, in most instances was a death sentence. In most instances, you are now out there. Now, there is a provision that's implied in the text. So leprosy wasn't always fatal. There was hope for healing because there was a process to show that you've been healed. So when the, when, when the, when the lepers cried out, I'm getting ahead of myself, but when the lepers cried out asking Jesus for uh, mercy on them, he told them to go and do the thing that you do when you are healed, even though they weren't healed yet. Okay, so let me back up. Let me back up because your clock is ticking on me. Let me back up. These men, they see Jesus. Now, how? I wonder for a long time, how did they know Jesus? They see him from afar off. How do they know Jesus from anybody else? They, they see Jesus and they begin to cry out to him, uh, Minister Martin. They begin to cry out to Jesus with a loud voice. They lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now, now, now it was it was it was confusing to me but most of the time the answers are right there you know Jesus will give you the answer to the test while he giving you the test I didn't understand how they knew who he was from a distance crying out to him how do they know he's Jesus nobody told him he's Jesus well the answer is right there in verse 11 because he was passing through Samaria of Galilee, Samaria and Galilee. And as our assistant pastor proclaims all the time, Jesus was from Nazareth. He says Jesus of Nazareth all the time. Where was Nazareth? Oh, uh-oh. I gave y'all a quiz. Where was Nazareth? Where was Nazareth? In Galilee. Okay, all right. In Galilee. Say in Galilee. Where was Nazareth? All right, we're going to have to do Bible geography. Come on, y'all, put that on the list. Amen. So they, these men, were acquainted with Jesus because they're his homeboys. So when they see Jesus coming, they know it's him. And they begin to cry out to them. Only one was from Samaria, so the other nine had a hunch who he was because they're from the same place, right? And so they begin to cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy upon us. And he saw them and he said unto them, go show yourselves unto the priest. I just want to encourage the people that's got issues right now. You got problems right now. You've been praying about them and God is not answering you the way you thought he should answer you. Jesus doesn't answer them and say, mercy be unto you. Jesus does not answer them and says, you are healed from your infirmity. Jesus answers them and says, go show yourself. And some of us been praying for God to do something and the answer we got didn't fit the question that we asked. But you just got to have enough faith to go and do what he said. If he said, go show yourself, get up and go show yourself. We want God to answer us a certain way. Then we want to come to church and we want somebody to give us confirmation. And then when we want confirmation, then we want to put a fleece out that, God, if it was really you, I want you to do this and I want you to do that. And then we never move. Many of us are sacrificing the blessings, the bountiful blessings, the exceeding abundantly blessings that God wants to do in our lives because we won't get up and move. He says, uh, he says, go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass as they went, they were cleansed. He tells them to get up and do something. And as simple as that, they get up and do it. They don't negotiate with God. They don't try to disqualify the instructions. They just get up and move out of obedience. What would happen if something as simple as your pastor saying, take a victory lap around here while you're in pain, would cause your pain to go away? What if something as simple as getting up in the morning, spending extra time praying and spending extra time reading Bible would cause the reconciliation and salvation in your family that you've been asking God to do anyway? What? What do we cost? 
What's the price tag for our disobedience? How, how much have we cost ourselves? Because we won't act when God says do it. 